Do you guys have a favorite birthday? It came up on my phone at 8 o'clock yesterday. I'm like, yep. Ice cream cake? Ice cream cake? There you go. I put it on. Like chocolate? Chocolate and ice cream. And their birthdays are like a couple days apart, so usually we met them. Usually when we when Pizza Hut was still around, we usually met them around your guys' birthdays. Yeah, no, it's okay. Well, right now I'm just, uh, if anyone has any cake that they really like for their birthday, I'm just uh, writing down some ideas here. I'm surprised you didn't mention German chocolate. I like all cake. <laughs> I like carrot cake. I like the white cake. I always like the spicy cake. Oh, I have no idea. Oh, I have no idea. 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 out of this year book. This is the American Cake by Ann Byrne. Um, and uh, yeah, unfortunately, uh, I, I finished up two years ago, uh, but you know, COVID hit and I wasn't able to, to keep on going. So, um, so we're just going to switch over here to the presentation. And uh, if, uh, if you so wish, after we're done here, uh, I have some, just a 
a couple fun little surveys here where uh, people can look at four different cakes here that are called cakes, but are they really cakes? So we're just kind of having an idea here as to what you think. Um, and uh, then, at the end, I got five cakes. We're going to keep them a mystery as to which cakes they are, but they're five of the cakes that I made. And um, uh, hopefully, I think we'll have enough for a little bit of sampling for, for everyone. Um, and um, so, why do you choose me? Why did you want to do this? <laughs> yeah, um, so. Uh, okay, thanks. So, what. Well, I'll, I'll get to that. <laughs> but yes, um, but I got a little clicker here at my wife, so let's see if it should be clicked earlier. Yeah, we're in the Zoom then, so you can't. Oh, there it goes. Oh, all right. So it's flipped. All right. Maybe just slow. <laughs> <laughs> all right, it just had to get All right, so it, so it started with a podcast. So um, I was listening to Stucky Mist in History way back 2016, actually. And I, they had an interview with Ann Byrne. And she had this American cake book, and it has a. Uh, uh, has, uh, your, the recipe and has a little history on it. Uh, she's even also has a, a little bit of scientific explanation of why we do the things we do with faith. So uh, I really enjoyed the interview and it caught my interest and I put it on my uh, wish list for Christmas one year. That's right. Uh, so she, it was published back in September 6th. Uh, and burned a little background on her. Uh, so she used to be a food editor at Orlando. She studied at French cooking at a French place. Um, and uh, she, this is not her first book. So she had an initial uh, series called um, uh, the Cake Mix Doctor series. And this was a busy time in her life. And you know, she had two young kids and she would have, uh, have um, take the cake mix boxes from stores. And she would kind of... Uh, uh, fancy it up, do some things with them, and so she, she made some books about that. Um, I, I don't have any of those books, but she, she was this popular. Um, and if you want to learn more about Anne, that's her address. Uh, so, why did I want it? Why was I interested in this book? So, it's about baking. I've been interested in baking a long time in my life. Uh, the history, I, I've grown really interested in history over the years. And there's science, and that's all about me. And, and so this, it really, all this kind of sounds familiar about someone. So, uh, yes, it certainly is me. <laughs> um, just a little background on who I am. Uh, so I'm David Seymour. I grew up in Horsehead, so I'm local. Uh, I attended Corning Community College and Alfred University, and I've been an engineer for Corning for 21 years already. It's hard to believe. Um, and I grew up enjoying baking. I remember uh, just talking to my son about the very first cake I made was at a Super Saturday program in Horses. It was a coffee cake. And I made that cake several times with my mom and um, you know, just really uh, enjoyed baking ever since. So, who am I not? I am not a historian. <laughs> Don't take my word for anything I say. Please. <laughs> Follow up if you're really interested. Uh, I am also not a professional baker. Please don't judge looks on something. <laughs> so, um, now, I, I initially started, uh, I received it as a Christmas present way back in 2017. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I tried two recipes over that Christmas break. They were both gingerbread recipes. Um, and I was trying to do it chronologically through the book. I, I was, my intention was to go through every book, every recipe at that time. Uh, but I kind of set aside after gingerbread, it's not very exciting, it's okay, but um, then September 9th, 2018, I tried a cake that inspired this project. So, it had a secret ingredient, and, and for this, I have, I have uh, already, uh, I have requested a couple volunteers ahead of time, so 
John, if you don't mind. I don't know, please. Mike. Watch the camera. Fuck her. Fuck her. Fuck her. Test subjects. Fuck her. Fuck Introduce yourself in a very loud voice so everyone can hear. I'm Natalie. <laughs> I'm Caitlin. Hi, I'm Caitlin. Very good. And I'm David. I have a special ingredient. An ingredient that I was like, wow, I can't believe this cake was made with it. And this cake is an awesome cake. I love this cake. And, and because I had this cake, I made. I need two more cakes after this. <laughs> right. is, that, is that amazing? Do either of you know German? Uh, I don't think so. No? You know, do you speak any German? I know a little German. Is that, that's a word. <laughs> Have you ever heard the word sauerkraut? Yes. yes. Yeah. Yeah. Your dad likes it. Oh, okay. Yeah, you heard it too. It sounds like. It looked like you made a face when you heard it. <laughs> yeah? You heard it? What? So, so, you know what ger the German uh, translation of that is? It's, it's sweet goodness. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's what German means sweet goodness. Would you like to try a little something? <laughs> yeah. You've tried it before? No? You never tried it? Well, here's your opportunity. <laughs> hey, look at this cake. We use this recipe, this, this ingredient in this cake. Would you like to try it? Sure. Okay, no? I'll try it. You, you try a little? All right. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is the tricky one. You have to open it from the bottom. Don't look at the picture. <laughs> I can't figure out what this is. 
Sa sauerkraut <laughs> is uh, sour cabbage, fermented cabbage. Uh, yeah. <laughs> It looks, it looks it's, it's, it's been chopped up cabbage. That's what it is. Uh, uh, and yeah, take a good whiff of this. Take a good whiff of this. And you're going to be like, holy cow, how could you possibly mess me up? Yeah, like, how can this possibly be? So, um, yeah, I, I, I saw that recipe, had to try it. I tried it, couldn't believe it. And that is what convinced me, like, I gotta do something about this. Uh, you, you gotta rinse it out. That's the trick here. Is you don't use it as a, you rinse it out, and then you, you put it in the cake. Um, so I decided I would do this right. I would make a, 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 every cake recipe in the book. I end up with just 95 of the cakes. Um, uh, I would do one per week. Uh, I would taste it, and I would share the cake. Uh, and get other people's opinions on this. And I would document it with a picture and, and a background. I would share it on Facebook with my friends and family. Uh, just in, the, in over time, they really were, responded well to it. And the more I did it, the more I researched the history of these things and and, uh, and shared some of the science behind it. So yeah, it became really fun to, to do when, I, when you had people participating in it. All right, here's the legalese, OK? Please. So, the views that I'm going to be sharing, these are my views. I recognize these are my views. Please recognize I recognize that these are my views. <laughs> I recognize that other people have different tastes. Um, I will be actually rating these, okay? These are my ratings, all right? I understand other people are going to have things, different tastes, and that's great. Uh, I'm glad different people like different things. However, that being said, some people think pound cake is exciting. They are wrong. <laughs> So, I just, they can like what they want. But let's talk about pound cake. Let's get a little, you know, I kid at it, but let's talk a little bit about it. Why do you call it a pound cake? Well, you know, I would guess it was a, weighs a pound, right? <laughs> well, really what it is, is it, it's an easy way to remembering how, how, how to make the cake. It's one pound of flour, one pound of sugar, one pound of eggs, one pound of butter, <laughs> right? You blend it all together, and that's what it is. Now, it's not, not 12 eggs, all right? So, I, I, I know I have it there, but. <laughs> you also have to remember, this is, this is part of the history, is eggs used to be smaller than what we have now, right? So, and, and that, that's also the trick. How do you, how do you, you know, know how many eggs to use? So, so they had a, a pound of eggs. But this is just a, a simple recipe to remember back when uh, times were, you know, harder. You didn't have, how do you communicate this information? You know, so now I do feel six pound cake recipes in the in the book is a little much, right? So I made six of them, even though it's not my favorite thing. Um, but I want to I want to highlight Melinda's uh, Russell here. Um, now it's called a Washington cake. It's a pound cake with just a little lemon in it, but. Um, uh, so, but I want to talk about it, because this, this is an interesting history here. All right, so, uh, Melissa Russell, she was born in 1812 uh, to a free black woman in Washington country, uh, County, Tennessee. Now, uh, by 1831, she was an orphan. Uh, well, she's 19, but her, her mother had died. Uh, so she was going to go to Liberia. But on the way there, she got robbed by a fellow traveler. So she got stuck in a town uh, called Lynchburg in Virginia. Uh, she was taught how to cook by an enslaved woman, Fanny Stewart. Uh, she married, she became a mother, and then she was a widow uh, at, uh, uh, when, when her son was very young. Uh, she moved back to a place called Chucky Mountain in, near Cold Spring, Tennessee. Uh, with her son, and she ran a pastry shop, shop for six years, you're learning uh, using what she had been taught. Uh, but during the Civil War, she had to flee uh, to Paw, Paw, Michigan, which is a pretty cool name. Uh, she self-published a cookbook to try to fund her way back home. But then, uh, all the books but one got lost in a fire in the, in the town. And uh, this is the book. This is the single remaining book 
uh, that we know about uh, that, she, what, that she had published. And this, uh, she, she has a biography in this book. This is the only way we know anything about this woman, uh, was that she had published a book about herself, and the recipe is in it. Um, uh, give a glimpse as to uh, what kind of food uh, was being uh, made back then. So, now, the thing to, to look at these, uh, and you get uh, the whole cookbook, the whole story here, uh, historian um, uh, investigated this, um, um, uh, her, her cookbook, and, and gave all the background here. So, uh, but just look at how these, these are, one, these are called receipts, right? Uh, not recipes, but receipts. And these recipes, they're just list of ingredients. They'll tell you quantities, but they don't really tell you much more than that. They don't tell you how to make any of the cakes or the, the other recipes that she did. Um, they're just kind of lists, and they expect you to already know this. Um, and right here is the Washington cake, right? So um, now, uh, Washington cake used to be uh, probably might have been our term king cake, but you know, after the Revolutionary War, kings weren't so popular, so we call them Washington cakes. Queen's cakes were liberty cakes and things like this. So uh, I'm not sure if that's the right term. I might be misread. Don't take my word. Uh, here is uh, the Washington cake. Uh, you know, it's a pound cake. It's not going to get higher marks for me. Sorry. <laughs> um, and if there's a key ingredient, it's a pound cake. It's not supposed to have a key ingredient in here. So uh, that's, uh, yeah. Uh, I like the history far more than I like the pound cake. Now, early baking, recipes, like I said, were, they were called receipts. Or just, uh, there was no standardization. No one had standard sized pans. No one had standard sized measuring cups. Uh, you, you, you grab the cup that you had, and you just say, well, you, you know, the grandpa's cup. Uh, you know, you just, that's what you do. They cast it down. Um, and there's no standard ingredients either, right? You know, you don't go to a store and you get the same flour that you can get anywhere else. And, and this, you know, the, the, um, you know, Farmer Brown's uh, uh, field, whatever he grew that, you know, that's what he had to work with. So, um, so, uh, and then, you know, works. I at least I would take uh, uh, for granted that um, the. Your oven has a temperature control, right? You, you, I want 350, it's 350. Uh, back then, that is not the case. You're throwing in wood, and you know, is it too much wood, too little wood? Uh, you stick your hand in. That's your temperature. <laughs> um, and then you use what you had. Uh, so, you know, some cakes have wands, some cakes have pecans. Well, that's because, you know, did the cake develop in the south or the north? Because that's what you had. Uh, you had black walnuts, you had hickory nuts. Um, and I want to emphasize, this is hard, hot work. Um, it is often performed by servants and, and those who were enslaved. Um, and we should recognize that a lot of times these cakes, uh, they were made for people who, the people who made them didn't get to enjoy them, right? Uh, so, uh, as time went on, ingredients got cheaper, uh, more and more people got to enjoy these. But in the early years, sugar was expensive, you know, spices were expensive. Uh, and these cakes, there were massive, huge cakes. I mean, just the list of ingredients, uh, just enormous. Um, but just to recognize, not everyone got to enjoy these in the old days. Um, so, we're talking about standardization. I want to introduce you to two people who really uh, revolutionized baking. Uh, so first off, Mary, uh, she was a, uh, first. She was a teacher at Boston Cooking School in 1879. She became principal, and she wrote the book, a uh, cookbook, in 1884. Um, and then Fanny came. She was uh, her student and star pupil, such that she became assistant director and principal of the school. Um, and she wrote a follow-up recipe book to her cookbook to, uh, to Mary's. Um, and I, there's a little back and forth. I don't know who, who really to credit here, but I'm going to credit both of them, that they are the ones who really push for standardized measurements and for um, 
you know, uh, when, when you look at a recipe, uh, you, that the ingredients are listed in the order that you're going to use them, right? So, so as to help keep track of where you're at and, and to know uh, 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 the order here of how you should. Um, the level measurements, you know, leveling the cup, right? So they said do that, right? And, and they would explain the science in their cookbooks as to this is why we do it. So. Uh, we should, you know, give them a lot of credit because this really revolutionized the, the baking. Um, and uh, uh, Fanny started her own school uh, soon afterwards. Um, and so this American Jelly Roll book comes from Fanny's cookbook. Um, interesting enough, right? The first time it was recorded up by Utica. So kind of, you know, somewhat local connection here. Um, and this is an example of what you use on hand. So you would use a, a big uh, dripping pan uh, to spread out the, to bake the cake. And uh, the jelly rolls changed over time. It was first a jelly cake was uh, thin layers of cake with jelly in between. And then they just did that one big layer in the dripping pan. And they were just spread over the top and cut slices out. And then someone said, you know what? Why if I just kind of roll it up? And then I'll cut it and make little slices in it. It, it looks kind of pretty, right? Um, and it's uh, kind of handy when you're on the farm and handing it out off to everyone. So it makes a large amount of cake. Uh, so this is my uh, jelly roll. Um, I used a red currant, but I kind of felt that was a, a, a well, not strong enough flavor. So I would use something stronger. Uh, myself, maybe a, a strong, strong strawberry preserve or something. So, um, but yeah, it was all right. Um, and then someone else uh, who also um, started, uh, was, was helped revolutionize baking. So, uh, Dione Lucas. I, I don't know, has anyone else heard of her before? No. So, I, I did not. Uh, so she was London born. She was the first one to graduate from Le Cordon Bleu Cooking School. Now you've probably heard that, uh, you know, sounds like chicken Cordon Bleu, right? <laughs> Not related, it turns out. <laughs> they didn't do it. it, is, it is, uh, they both use the term. I didn't know what Cordon Bleu was. It, it, it stand, it's, uh, I think it translates as French ribbon, or blue ribbon. So back, back in the medieval times, the, the highest uh, uh, order of knights uh, in France would have uh, wear blue ribbons to, to donate that, to designate that. So, High quality, right? Blue ribbon, and, and that's kind of why we use blue ribbons nowadays, too. At least one possible origin of that. And so the cooking school picked up that, right? They're the best blue ribbon school, right? So, so she graduated from there, uh, good for you. Um, and then she opened up her own schools in London and New York City. She was the first schools outside of France to do that. Um, and then uh, this is where the revolution, she was the first woman to have a cooking show. Uh, and, and that was 15 years before Julie Sajai was. But, you know, we don't hear about her. Um, so, uh, Dionese, uh chocolate roulande. Uh, so, it, a roulande is, a, is, is just like the jelly roll. Uh, it's a, you roll it up. Uh, it looks like you, you go to the, the Swiss roll in the, in the grocery store, right? Um, it's like that. Uh, so when she came in New York City in 1940, a cousin of hers took up to the Adirondacks because it was really hot in the city. Um, and uh, this recipe comes from the French chef uh, there. Um, and it is, was a cake kind of ahead of the time. It's a flourless cake. Um, and the reason why you might want to have a flourless cake, it helps, uh, it gives a creamy, silky texture. And it's a very strong flavor. So this is, Diamondese chocolate moulin. Uh Chocolate, whipped cream is in the center. And definitely not flour. <laughs> so, and this was great. This was wonderful. This was very tasty. Um, uh, now you can see I had some trouble with this in the cracks. So again, not professional, first time. Um, but it was tasty. Uh, a tunnel of fudge. Another great chocolate cake here. Now, and. I think a really cool history here. So we're going to pick the history up here in the 1950s. Some Jewish and German immigrants came to Minneapolis. 
and they needed some special pans uh, to make their bun kuchen, which I believe um, translates to a cake made for like a gathering of people. Uh, bun is, is a gathering, and, and kuchen is definitely cake. So uh, I believe this is a cake that you have for a gathering of people. So, uh, now, at, in, at the time, there was a small company uh, called Nordicware uh, that made, that they had a meeting with these immigrants, and then they, they said, sure, yeah, we'll, we'll make some pans for you. And, and so they did. Um, and it's interesting, they took that bun, they added a T uh, to come to, with their own name of it, now it's called a butt pan. And by 1966, they had sold 500 pans. I'm sure I bought one. <laughs> <laughs> so, and you know, I, I, I have a pan here. Uh, this is your typical bunt pan, right? Right? So, uh, that's your typical bunt pan. That's somewhat like what they would have back, back in the old country. And then they also have some really cool ones. I had to show off my castle one. Right? <laughs> oh, <laughs> that's, 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 they got cool ones. Not practical. <laughs> so, now let's, uh, we're, we're going to skip a few, uh, we're going to skip over to, uh, uh, in 1966, the Pillsbury Bake Off. And Mary Petrelli won $25,000, back then this is like 200 k now, I think. Um, and she baked the Golden State Snack. Won first place. Has anyone tried Golden State Snack? <laughs> no. No. But let's talk about second place, Ella. <laughs> Houston. She won with a tunnel of fudge. Uh, she used a product. It was Pillsbury sponsored this contest. <laughs> so she used a Pillsbury product called Double Dutch Fudge Buttercream Dry Frosting Mix. Uh, so as near as I can tell, this is a powdered mix you add water to it and it makes a frosting. I don't know, has anyone used a, a dry powdered frosting mix before? I don't know. It's discontinued. Okay, okay, yeah, yeah. So they would mix this into the cake and uh, it, it produced this, uh, this fudgy center in it. It's like magic. Um, it was very popular. Um, oh. And by coincidence, she also used many at quizzes, but she also used a butt pan, a little known um, uh, pan. Uh, so it produces a, like, kind of a magical little reaction that the center is kind of a fudgy interior. Um, they discontinued it, so this particular recipe tries to mimic that um, as best as they can. It used, you have to use a butt pan, well, I don't know if you have to, but you're supposed to use a butt pan. The chocolate's really great. And he uses pecans. Uh, this is an awesome cake. My son uh, wants it for his birthday uh, cake every year. So, and you yeah, haven't quite got the knack of getting it out of the pan. It just sticks a little bit. So, but, okay. um, now, something to consider here. I told you, 1966, they sold 500 pans, right? They are now over 70 million pans. That's 69,999,500 more pans than since before I was done with So, I think they owe well something. Um, uh, I didn't mention it, but she, she lived like 98 years. So, just, I think, proof that cake is good for <laughs> <laughs> um, Germans, chocolate cake. Ah, so the Germans, they've given us many wonderful uh, <laughs> culinary uh, contributions, right? <laughs> Sauerkraut. <laughs> All fantastic. We must, you know, acknowledge their culinary contributions that we appreciate. German chocolate cake is not German. <laughs> One thing to keep in mind when you leave here, tell everyone, it's not German. If you see German chocolate cake somewhere, you have my permission to take out your pen, to go and give it an apostrophe S, okay? It's Germans 
chocolate cake. Now let's explain what that, why that is the case. We're going to go back in time. We're going to go back, actually, to before the Revolutionary War, uh, to the founding of Baker's Chocolate Company. Uh, two people started. One was James Cannon, who's an Irish chocolatier. That's a great profession. Uh, 1764, this is in around the um, Boston area. Um, at that time, chocolate was a mainly a, a, something you would use to drink. You would never would have considered uh, putting it in a cake. Now, beyond comprehension, why would you do that? Why did you do that? Um, he sailed to the West Indies, never returned. He was going to get chocolate. Disappeared. Uh, very interesting. Like, uh, whatever happened to that? Person? The same thing with Melinda uh, Russell. We don't know what happened to her. We don't know if she ever got back home after that cookbook. Don't know. If it wasn't for the cookbook, we wouldn't know anything about her. So, um, well, James didn't show back up, so this widow sold the rest of the company to Dr. James Baker. Hence, Baker's Chocolate Company, and that was in 1780. That's why it's the founding of that. Now, we're going to skip ahead a few decades to um, uh, the 1850s, and English-American inventor Samuel German, now we're getting closer here, right? He was an employee of Baker's. He made a product in 1850 called German's Sweet Chocolate Bar. That's where the name comes from. It's his chocolate that is used to make the cake. Um, now, another interesting thing I didn't know about until I started researching it here. So, uh, it's a little later, but, um, so, see that? That logo is based on this uh, picture. Uh, the chocolate girl, I think the, the painter is Swiss. Um, uh, but, again, it, this is, it was used for a drinking chocolate. And so they used, they got permission to use the logo. So, now you know. Um, now, even further in time, nearly 100 years, uh, the German chocolate cake was entered in the Texas State Fair. State Fairs had problems. Um, it was printed in the Daily, Dallas Morning News, and it really caught on. It was really popular. Now, the thing is, it's not really about the cake. It's the frosting that I, this is, this is my opinion. <laughs> It's the frosting that matters. Um, and it was actually originally a filling, and you had a buttercream around it. But it was so popular that people said, just give me more of it, right? Just <laughs> put more on it. Um, and it's because it's awesome. Oops. So here is my German sweet chocolate cake. It uses unsweetened coconut, pecans, and evaporated milk. Evaporated milk is important um, uh, uh, in Texas. Um, and in many places we'll talk about that. Um, I gave it a five out of five, and it is, it takes work, but this is one of those cakes that's worth the effort. Uh, now the importance of evaporated milk. So evaporated milk has 60% of its water in it and is heat sterilized. So that means that this can be preserved well. Uh, it differs from sweetness in that it doesn't have sugar added. It's easy to transport to distant locations, frontiers, islands, where there's few berries. Uh, it lasts a long time, so it's very convenient just to keep it on the shelf, uh, as opposed to if you kept your milk on the shelf, right? Um, so, battery milk, very important to these places. You'll see it time and time again in recipes where you see battery milk. Chances are it's somewhere where they didn't have access to regular milk. This also makes piece of stuff. <clears throat> now let's go over to Wellesley uh, uh, College. Um, and uh, so Women's College in Wellesley in Massachusetts. Um, and now at that time, uh, there was a Victorian medical science, state-of-the-art science, said you should have a bland diet. No sweets, no spices, because it's going to ruin your mental concentration on things. How can you constantly, how can you concentrate if you're eating sweets? So no. So, uh, there was a, it was kind of a rebellious act for young women to make fudge in their rooms. They would use Bar Road, Bunsen furs, uh, from the kitchen 
and there's some gas lights in the room. And so there is actually a poem uh, attributed to this. What perches us upon his chair to stir a saucepan held in the air? Which tipping pours upon our hair? Fudges. <laughs> so, um, and that's what really stands out about this cake. It's, it's the, the fudge frosting that he made on it. Um, and, it, you know, I, I get, didn't give it higher ratings because it's just chocolate on chocolate. Well, chocolate, <laughs> but I like having a little contrast, right? So, you know, this is interesting. I can, I realized you know, if you compare German chocolate cake to Wellesley chocolate, they're like the same cake. Just a little, there's like a two eggs difference. It's probably the biggest thing I could say. It stands out here. Now, another thing I came to, I found out afterwards is that um, Baker's Chocolate Company picked up on the German chocolate cake. They printed on the box of the back of their box, right? Hey, you want a recipe with some baker chocolate? Try this. Um, and they did the same thing with Wellesley. I mean, as I said, uh, Baker's was Boston, Wellesley's Massachusetts too, right? So they picked up on the popularity of this cake. Put it on the back of the box, now everyone can make it, right? So it might be one reason why they're so similar. So. Um, but I argue, for most cakes, really the frosting is the, char the character of that's my my. All right, now we're going to talk about an insurance salesman, Turn Baker. Now, uh, his name is Harry Baker. <laughs> I kid you not. That is his name. I tried to find a picture of Harry Baker so that we could share it and see what he looked like. Um, uh, I was unable to find one. Uh, I, I'm not a historian. I don't have full access to the whole archive. So sorry about that. I tried to make a substitute. <laughs> <laughs> this is what I envisioned when I came to With a little uh, 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 Harry Potter uh, Easter egg. For so. Um, Harry Baker, who was he? He was a Los Angeles insurance salesman. Uh, and he supplied cakes to the Brown Derby, a popular chain of restaurants out that way. And he invented the orange chiffon cake. Uh, this, some of these, these other cakes that I've talked to you about, a lot of their origins that have different, um, uh, like the pound cake was an English pound cake, right? We, we used it as our own, we had added to it. But the chiffon cake has a, is truly an, an orange, uh, origin because of its closely guarded secret. So closely that Terry Baker would take out his own garbage, which I feel like is a great line from a gangster movie. If you want to keep a secret, you take out your own garbage. Right? <laughs> so, I mean, but that's what he would do. Um, and the secret was vegetable oil. I, I, <laughs> was surprised that this was that secret, right? You know, I'm just so used to buying a store box, you know, cake mix and adding vegetable oil and, and, and oh, what's so secret about that? Well, when he retired, uh, he sold his, his secret ingredient to uh, Duncan Hines, I think it was, um, and, and, and then they shared it with the world. So now we all, we all get to share it. So. Now, let's talk about the difference between butter and oil. <laughs> so, going for butter, flavor, uh, you, you know, you just can't beat the butter flavor. Uh, the aeration, so because it's a solid fat, when you beat it, uh, like there's a, there's a step in, in the cake making that you beat it with the sugar and you add, try to add a lot of air to it to give it more, more uh, fluffiness, right? Uh, it great, makes a better texture cake. But, uh, it's more expensive, there's a lot more saturated fat in it, it it's harder to work with, sometimes too hard, sometimes it's melted, um, and you know, it has a shorter shelf life. So going for a vegetable oil, pretty much the opposite of all that, right? It adds moistness to it, uh, lowers saturated like fat and higher shelf life. So, um, now the negative is, you need a leavening agent to it. So when I say leavening agent, that's something that helps um, make the cake rise. So let's talk about 
how that's changed over time. Because at the very beginning, when, it, when we were talking about those, those gingerbread cakes in the colonial days, they didn't have much to work with. So they had egg whites. And you would beat it, you beat it, you beat it some more. Um, and you try to get a lot of air whipped into it, and you just kind of fold it in there, try not to break up those bubbles. Then you get pure lash. Ah, this is ash from a tree. Yummy! <laughs> uh, you could use yeast uh, to try it. Is that cake, really? This is bread. Um, now, once we get to baking soda, now we're getting somewhere. We, we can uh, we, we add something acidic to it, like uh, buttermilk, uh, and then it reacts and then produces bubbles. So that's great. Um, now, baking powder, right? I always got confused when I was a kid. Baking powder, baking soda, what do you use? It's the same thing, right? Uh, baking powder basically is baking soda, but with some cream of tartare that worked in there. Um, some cornstarch might be in there to, to um, help keep it from reacting too soon. You want it to react when you're, it's in the oven, so as to uh, you keep the bubbles to make the cake. You don't want to lose the bubbles. So, Back to the orange chiffon case. Key ingredients, vegetable oil, orange. Not surprising. But, uh, you know, I gave it a three. Uh, it, it tasted good. It's kind of like a orange uh, angel food cake. Um, but uh, it's just kind of the same flavor. So I don't, you know, kind of lose my attention. Um, trick is, when you're making a cake like chiffon or angel food cake, uh, don't grease the pan. And the reason why is, you want all of that light fluffiness, and it's very sensitive. So after baking, um, uh, it can collapse. So that's why you flip it over to, to maintain that height. You don't, it, it burns the side of the pan so as to give it some structure and hold on to it. So that's, that's why you don't grease the pan when you're making angel food cake for a chiffon. Now there is another thing, another contribution that Harry Baker uh, contributed to uh, here, and, and that is the Brown Derby Grapefruit Cake, maybe you might have heard. Uh, so again, just a little bit more about the Brown Derby. Uh, you know, it was famous uh, because you know, it had these, these Hollywood characters, a lot of Hollywood stars would hang out by the, by the, uh, uh, the one in Hollywood. The, the other one, uh, the one that started it, why it's called a brown derby was in the shape of a brown derby hat, but that's not the one that the stars hung out at. Now it was owned by Robert Cobb. Yes, that Cobb, the one that made the Cobb salad. So there's three culinary contributions from one place. So the story goes that a gossip columnist, uh, Luell Parsons, was on a diet, and she asked Bob Cobb for a less fattening cake. Does such a thing exist? Bob Cobb asked Harry Baker, that's the funniest thing to say, to throw grapefruit on something. So that's what <laughs> Harry Baker did. He invented the grapefruit cake. So pink grapefruit, cream cheese frosting, ah, that's less fattening for sure. Um, <laughs> he gave it out four out of five. I like the contrast of the cream cheese with the frosting. I can say that this is the best way of eating grapefruit. <laughs> now, why, why do I only have half a cake there, folks? Because <laughs> that is not how you usually have a cake. Well, let me tell you another story. It's supposed to be two layers. And that was two layers. It's just half a cake with two layers. This is what my first cake is. Now, it's a little hard maybe to see, but that cake is not flat. Those are chunks missing out of my cake. That's the yes. <laughs> <laughs> cakes out to cool, thinking, why would a cat be interested in cake? <laughs> I now cool my cakes in a closet, closed. <laughs> ah, now it's time to think Hawaii. Now, of all the ingredients, what do you think of when you think Hawaiian as an ingredient? Uh, Pineapple. Pineapple. Pineapple upside down cake. This is what a pineapple plant looks like. Isn't that interesting? It has one fruit on the end of it. You just chop that off. 
and it's the only fruit it's going to produce. It's not wine. Many of you probably know that. It, people wanted to grow it there. Um, it was introduced in the 1700s. Uh, the peak production uh, was in the 1970s. Then they, found, they were finding other places to grow this. Um, Dole even stopped canning there altogether, and Del Monte stopped growing it. Um, only 0.1% is grown there now of uh, uh, world supply. Just enough to say there's pineapple in Hawaii. Alright, so in eight, 1925, the, what we now call the Dole Food Company uh, had a recipe contest. Uh, 60,000 entries, can you believe it? And 2,500 of these were uh, variations of a pineapple upside down cake. And now it's, a, it's a, evidently a common cake at the time. It was a cast iron skillet. Um, and it was called a skillet cake. <clears throat> so uh, once Dole published the recipe, lots of people started wanting to use it. So this is, I actually got a cast iron pan just to make this cake. Um, pineapple, brown sugar. Uh, Marchino cherry, I like to keep it mariachi cherry, a little sombrero. Great cake, I love it. I think it's very flavorful. Um, brown sugar, you know, it's a really key. Now there is another connection with uh, Hawaii, uh, the Chantilly cake. Uh, there is no pineapple. Is there a second ingredient, folks, associated with? Hawaii. Macadamia nuts, yes, thank you. It's not David either. It's Australian. Uh, it introduced as a windbreak for sugar cane, so. Uh, and then Chantilly, I had never heard that word before. It comes from Chantilly, France. It's a sweetened whipped cream. Uh, and then uh, this cake was made at uh, 1950s at the Lahai Bakery in Oahu. Um, again, evaporated milk, very important. Why? It's an island, right? They don't have a lot of dairy cows. So it also gives that higher fat content. It's really, again, there's other uses for using it than other than you don't have a cow nearby. <laughs> so uh, here's the Chantilly cake. Um, uh, and I had some trouble getting the nuts to stick on the side. I might just sprinkle it on the top next time. But that's how the picture of the book looked. So, um, overall, it's a pretty good cake. Uh, I was disappointed. It has shulkin in it. Not enough shulkin. It needs more shulkin. Is that a good answer there? It needs more shulkin. Now, speaking of the Chantilly cake, this is, I was surprised when I was looking through here. There's a lot of interesting connections to these cakes that I've had. First up, moosewood. I love moosewood. I got the head. <laughs> it's a great place. Uh, how many people have been to moosewood? Oh yeah, yeah, it's great. Local. Here it is. National book. <laughs> yeah, make moose that popular. Of course, they, you know, they're popular because of their books. Uh, so, and this is a, a, a recipe from one of them. So, I, if you've not been there, I highly encourage you to try some. Uh, Boma Inn. I've actually stayed at this inn. Harrodsburg is one of our, our Corning's plants, and I, I had to go there, uh, Spiber Factory School back in the day, and uh, stayed out there, and then it had a gate. Didn't know about the gate. But it had a gate. Did have cheesy grits for the first time. It's pretty good. Uh, Hawaiian Chantilly Cake. Uh, we were fortunate to actually visit there last year, so I knew about the cake, knew about the bakery, went to the bakery. I, I, I think my cake was pretty comparable to <laughs> There's a pretty. Not professional. I have never been paid for it. I'm not professional. <laughs> Hershey Bar Cake. Been Hershey lots. Uh, so I feel I can qualify that. Yes. I have a connection to this place. It's Hershey's wonderful. Love it. Uh, and this is a Hershey Bar Cake. Uh, now, there is another connection here. I have to share it. It is not from the American Cake. It is from the American Cookie Book, which is a sequel to the American Cake Book. It comes from here, but I thought, this is just too good. I had to share this. Um, I'm going to share a name. 
Some folks from here may know this name. Uh, well, everyone should know this name, but some folks might know the connection. So I'm going to say, is Catherine Hepburn Brownies this recipe? So, how many people know the connection of Catherine Hepburn to Corny? I got a couple, got a couple people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I didn't know about this until I, I researched it. Catherine Hepburn. Her, she was named after her mother, Catherine. But her maid, Catherine Hepburn's maiden name. How do you say this? Catherine's mother's maiden name was not Hepburn, of course. It was Catherine Pope. So her, her grandfather founded Corning Incorporated. How about that? I didn't know that. That was a pretty cool connection. Um, so, uh, Catherine Houghton, Catherine Pepper's mother, uh, she had a very interesting history too. Um, uh, she, she was orphaned at age 16 in 1894. Um, and uh, so, her parents had this all in a, a strong desire to go to college as opposed to a finishing school. And, and so her uncle uh, had encouraged to go to a finishing school. That's what he wanted, but he said, no, she's going to go to college. Uh, so she went to Bird Mar? I don't know how to pronounce it. Mar. Thank you. Um, you see words on pages, you just don't know how to pronounce it. Um, so and she, she fought for women's suffrage, legalized birth control, and she, the organization that she helped found uh, went on to become Planned Parenthood. So, uh, so she has a very interesting history in herself, and I don't feel qualified to go much further in, into it, uh, but I thought, wow, what an interesting connection. I had to share that we were talking about. Um, so, talking about Catherine Pepper's brownies, uh, so she had shared this recipe with a, a, she also went to the same school and, and shared it with a student there, uh, was thinking about dropping out, and she shared her brownies with her, and then she went on and shared a recipe, uh, and, and she said, uh, this, their advice to her was, Small amounts of flour in, in, in the recipe. Um, it's uh, very easy to overbake, though, um, so I, I gave it lower marks. Sorry. Mm -hmm. Now, there were some weird cakes in this I wanted to share with you. Now, obviously, the first one up straight up, right? Sorry. Right? <laughs> but yet, there are other weird cakes in here. So, there was a California orange and olive cake. To me, olive oil seems like a strange, strange uh, ingredient. I like what it tastes like olive oil. Um, but, um, and then there's the Robert Redford cake. It had, it's another flower slate, but it uses hazelnuts uh, in it. Um, uh, cranberry cornmeal ricotta cake. There's several ingredients that don't sound right there. Um, and how they work together. A beet, an actual beet, a vegetable beet. Red melon cake with goat cheese frosting. So, is it going to taste like a beet? So, uh, you already know about the Awesome. Uh, boy, this is actually really pretty good. You didn't taste the olive oil. Uh, but it was, again, very moist because of the olive oil. And, yeah, Cassie really likes it. That's a good one. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, but you see, I rate it. It's the same thing all over again. Right? Come on, it's like a pound cake. <laughs> um, uh, the hazelnut thing uh, worked out pretty good for a flourless cake. Uh, you know, maybe it's just my imagination. I feel like it had a little Nutella flavor to it because of the hazelnuts. But you know, it was, it was pretty good. It was dry though. Dry. That's what we drink it. Um, and it took a lot to spread me. Yeah, boy, this is, I don't know all these things together. <laughs> Uh, cornmeal, you're kind of greedy. Uh, cornmeal, back uh, when you didn't, if, they, if you're in an area, you don't have access to wheat, to, to wheat flour, the cornmeal would be a regular ingredient that you would have. So this is, this is something. I want to make it again. <laughs> um, beets. Now, I've had, I have a little, I'm not fond of red velvet cake because it has like a ton of red food covering. Uh, it has its own history, sorry I can't get into it today. But um, So I do really enjoy the idea of using beets for that red color, 
I feel like it's a lot healthier choice. Uh, I'm not sure about the goat cheese. And I like goat cheese. I'm not sure if I would use it. I just use the regular cream cheese. And I think this would be a wonderful, great alternative to the red food, the red, red food filling. I just caught what it is. A red food filling cake, right? Yeah. So, uh, so that there are also some hardship cakes. So these are the cakes that you would make with it's wartime or depression, right? And you don't have a lot. These are the cakes. They're not going to be super fancy, right? But you should have these recipes on hand because you know when times are hard, you 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 want to have these available. Um, so the Appalachian apple stack cake has a great tradition to it. Uh, what? Uh, I don't have verification on it, but the story goes that uh, you might, if you're invited to a wedding, you might be asked to bring a layer of cake to the wedding. And for the reception, you would, everyone would pile those layers on, you would spread <laughs> it with some uh, apple butter in between for the filling, and, and that's the wedding cake. So I really enjoy that, the tradition, that I, I like the idea of everyone chipping in and bringing something of their own to, to contribute. Uh, I think he has a great tradition. Some strong molasses flavor. If you like molasses, <laughs> you like this. Uh, yes, yes, whipped cream would uh, help help liven it up. <laughs> Cowboy cake. Yeah. <laughs> this this is quite quite the cake too. Uh, caught me by surprise, really. Uh, this this is a uh, this is a vegan cake. It has no butter. It has no eggs. In it. it has no milk, no dairy, nothing. This is the cake. You're out on the ranch, right? Um, driving little ponies. You don't have anything like that around. So you use what you got. Um, uh, you, you might be trekking out west to, you know, to, to find a homestead, and you just you can't carry that kind of stuff around. So uh, you would. This is also called a boiled raisin. And that's what you do here. You, you boil the raisins, you soften the raisins, you get the r yummy raisin juice, uh, and then you bake the cake in your Dutch oven, um, and uh, it's really quite good. Um, this city spice meringue cake. Uh, so I use a meringue as, as kind of a frosting substitute. Uh, a little on the dry side for me. Um, out of the hardship cakes, it's not one I would probably go to. But all the cakes, right? You get, you can't compare it to your, your favorite cake that you know, all of butter, cream, frosting, and everything. You, you, you gotta recognize these are the cakes you go to when you don't have much else. Uh, like the applesauce cake. Um, so they, you know, you substitute uh, the applesauce for, for other ingredients like eggs or uh, you don't have much, this is what you go to. If you have something else, you go to the other something else. Uh, George Washington Carver's peanut cake. Uh, so uh, he went around, right, trying to get people interested in peanuts, and this is one of the cakes. This is, it makes a huge batch of this. It's a rolling pan, I mean, this is huge. Uh, uh, it has, has always tastes like peanuts, um, and it, has, it tastes like molasses. Uh, so, um, uh, again, it, it would feed a lot of people. Um, now, I want to talk about, uh, compare, when you, when you have difficult cakes and uh, easy cakes, right, and, and, and taste, right? So, um, I want, this is the Robert E. Lee cake. That took me five hours to make. Uses 15 eggs. Um, it was really hard to make at frost. Uh, the, the, the layers of the filling were, were slip layers, so you try to cut it, and the cake just shifts everywhere. Uh, it did not taste good. The texture was. It took a lot of time for not a lot of Lazy daisy. You make that in an hour. Um, and the top is a caramelized coconut. Lots of butter, right? You know, that's 
tastes awesome. <laughs> it tastes awesome, and and you know, you tell people, boy, that took me 15 hours to make, that, five hours to make. Um, you know, like the Robbie Lee cake. No, we might not believe you, but at least you know that's worth making. No, that's not. <laughs> uh, so speaking of lazy dates, uh, that phrase started in around 1900. Just to describe a lazy day. Um, it's popular stitch knit needlework. Um, and the first time the cake was mentioned was back in 1914. Uh, it became popular in the 1940s because it was uh, easy to make. Um, as I said, this was awesome. Brown sugar, that was a key ingredient. Yeah, this is, this is awesome stuff. Uh, so, I briefly want to talk about sugar making um, because. Uh, because this is how we get molasses. Now, to greatly simplify sugarcane stuff, right? You grow the sugarcane, you cut the sugarcane, you mash the sugarcane, you're getting all the juice from the sugarcane. Then it's going to go into a centrifuge that we crystallize out the sugar in it. And you do a centrifuge and you're separating out the white sugar from this grade A molasses. And you're going to do it again and you get the grade B. And you're going to do it again and you get the white the white sugar, and then you, the, the sea molasses is also called black strap. So that's the last step. There's no <laughs> sugar left in black strap. Um, so you, you, at the store, you know, you're going to be getting this grade A molasses. But the, here's here's the thing I found out while doing that. Brown sugar, what is it? It is sugar and molasses. So you separate out the sugar, and then they put the molasses back. <laughs> so, and I tell you, brown sugar, this is awesome stuff. This is a, this is a secret ingredient. If you want to make a cake great, you add brown sugar. <laughs> uh, so you can do this also at home. Just you take one cup of white sugar, a teaspoon of white molasses, and that's white brown sugar. You add two, that's dark. <laughs> so if you want to simplify your your cabinet. You can make your own. Or if you're, you, you, you realize you don't have any brown sugar, you, oh, there you go. Hopefully you have molasses. <laughs> now, here are the impressive cakes that I do say are worth the effort. You know, you're not going to necessarily make this every weekend, uh, but uh, if you have something special going on, you may want to consider one of these cakes. German chocolate cake, well, we talked about that, right? So let's go to the Japanese fruit cake. Uh, don't like the term, right? Because it's not Japanese. You might see a trend here, right? It's not Japanese. They call it Japanese to give it an exotic uh, notation, right? But, boy, this center part here, I have a yummy stuff right there. That's coconut, orange, pecans, raisins. Uh, that's great. And this is a, a, a seven minute frosting, really a 14 minute frosting. Boil it twice. Uh, so misleading. Um, and yeah, this is this is awesome. Love that. Uh, this is just me reminiscing now. Uh, so silver uh, cabinet cake, carrot cake. So this is a, a, a restaurant out west, um, and uh, used to have a small bakery in the back, and they would cook it and bring it over to the, to the main restaurant. Um, this was a great recipe as well. Uh, you know, it's loaded up with pineapple and walnuts. You got the cream cheese frosting. Oh yeah, three layers. Wow, that's great. Um, the Lady Baltimore cake. Uh, you know, I, I was listening to, um, oh, what was the name? What was the play? Old uh, Arsenic, no lace. They mentioned this cake. Uh, they, they, they said, oh, I just made a, a Lady Baltimore cake. <coughs> if they offer you a Lady Baltimore cake, and at least in that place, you don't take it. <laughs> they call it arsenic for a reason, so don't do that. But, um, uh, so raisins, figs, walnuts, sherry, uh, lemons. Uh, yeah, this was a, a, a great cake. Uh, you can see all that stacked in between those layers. And you know. uh, Smith Island cake. So Smith Island uh, has... So briefly, you know, so John Smith coming over Virginia. What's he going to do? He's looking over. Ah, I see that tree. I'm calling that John Smith tree. Ah, I see that I, river. That's a Smith River over there. Ah, I see that island. 
at Smith Island. So that's where Smith Island comes from. There's a uh, 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 lady who owned a boarding house on there and made this cake. And you look, look at all the layers there, the different cake, and each layer has a little chocolate layer in between. Yum, yum, yum. So uh, you can even have a variety. I, I took the option where you put little um, peanut butter cups on top. So I, I'm not really sure if that added a lot. I wouldn't recommend going doing that. But uh, again, island evaporated milk. Great. Uh, the Lane cake. So uh, uh, this is an Alabama state uh, state cake. Uh, this one won the Georgia State Fair. Uh, I'm sure. Okay, but um, the uh, uh, <laughs> there's a key ingredient in this one is bourbon. So a lot of bourbon. Um, uh, then uh, you have raisins, the uh, mariachi cherries, pecans. Um, yeah, this uh, the, the lady who made this cake said that her family, uh, she used to have a, 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 that seven minute frosting over it. She said her family said, oh, don't 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 put that frosting on it. Just just leave it like that. It looks pretty and, and you know that, that you know, it's too much work. Just leave it like that. And I agree. You know that's that's plenty, right? And this this is very yummy. That's work. Uh, the dough bash cake court. Um, uh, this was my last cake. I, I saved this for last because this seemed to be one of the most daunting cakes. You know, you, the Smith Island was also daunting. But, uh, in between here, this is a, uh, a uh, like pudding layer in between. And, and then you have a, a, a frosting on the outside that kind of holds it all in there. It's you know several layers stacked. Um, the, the custard crummy, the, the custard. You make that custard a day ahead of time and that's to thicken up, right? So yeah, this is a little uh, worse. So you want to make sure it's worth it. Um, so to keep me humble, <laughs> here are my feelings. Early on, no o'clock, Milwaukee Sunshine Cake. It does sound like a nice name, but it uses 13 eggs. It tastes pink. I don't think it's what I want for a cake. But you can also see uh, the, 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 the frosting didn't really come together. Uh, I, it turns out a lot of these recipes, I don't know if it's just my oven or what, but a lot of these recipes, um, uh, I find uh, I have to cook them a little longer than what the recipe says. So this was a little underbaked. Eh, sorry. Ah, uh, oh, the rum sizzle cake. Uh, <laughs> So you have to make candy ginger root and candy orange lemon peel. Well, so you, 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 you do that, you put in the, the, the sugar and the water, and I didn't use enough water, and I burnt the ginger root, and I had to do that all over again. And then meanwhile, the cake itself is worthless. Squishy fruit in it. 
the, the Trinity Latte, which I didn't show here, now that really came about because uh, evaporated milk companies started up in Mexico. They put a recipe on the back of their, their uh, carton and say, hey, try this and buy more evaporated milk. So. Uh, some general cake baking guidelines. So make sure the butter is soft. Uh, so, and there's a difference between room temperature in Georgia summer and a New York State winter. So I, I can leave that butter out on the counter for a day in, in, our, in winter, right? So I'll, I'll put it in the cupboard where Jack can't do it. And then, but it doesn't get soft. <laughs> so yeah, I have to put it in the microwave. And you know, that's a, you know, a delicate balance between soft and puddle. So, um, but I think of squishable. Make sure the butter is a little squishy. Cream the butter with the sugar, and then you add the eggs to it. Again, that helps with that aeration part. Uh, sift the dry ingredients together. The sifting helps. Um, they, they, you know, used to sift just to get the little maggots out of it. So hopefully you don't have that problem. But you, by sifting it, right, you're getting it all mixed together and, and, and kind of fluffy. Um, and maybe uh, screen out a maggot. Uh, now, first, you know, you have that butter sugar egg mixture, right? So what you're going to do when you add to it, this is the order you do. Do a third of the dry ingredients. Half the, half the liquid ingredients. It might be water, it might be um, uh, uh, molasses or you know, whatever. And then you add another third of the dry. And then you add a third to the last, the liquid and the last of the dry. So by doing it, you're not going to get lumps in it. Um, and, and, you know, it helps blend everything together. So I want to say thank you very much for your attention. And thank you for coming today. Really appreciate it. I had such a fun time making this experiment or this, this project, um, and I'm just happy to share it with you all. So thank you very much. Now I have kept the five cakes that I have prepared for you secret for a little added mystery and surprise. Um, the uh, first one, uh, I think you probably guess, is going to be the chocolate sauerkraut cake. Nice. So, uh, actually, I do have a, I do have a, a list here. I'm looking at this list, but I do want to say it is now time to dig into. <laughs> <laughs> The orange chiffon cake. So we'll, we'll get to see what Harry Baker had made. The cowboy cake, which is me. Yeah. Okay, I'm not having a cowboy cake. Lazy Days took me forever. Lazy Days. And Dionese chocolate Mulan, which is gluten free. So, and all of these are are nut free if you don't have coconut um, in the Lazy Days. But there are there are no nuts. In it. But if you Want, there are the recipes there, so you can double check the, the ingredients, so let's make sure it's suitable. Um, uh, but yeah. So uh, we're going to go through that up now. Uh, there's also over here a little fun survey. Uh, some cakes that are called cakes that are in the book. Are they cakes? I don't know. You, you can go down. Work on the cake. If there's a...
around the world. He, he was on one of the cooking contest shows and he saw how much he hates baking. <laughs> this is all about the precision, so. People do tend to sell in one or the other. Yeah. I never thought of that, but I'm such a good
Yeah. It was it was what I wanted. See, I'm half Polish, so I grew up with sauerkraut. Yeah, and, <laughs> and then and um uh John's last name is Solinsky, so uh -huh. they, they're familiar with Polish. Oh, that's probably my tripod. Uh, you tripod that. That makes sense. 